Hi everyone, this is Beverly Craig from the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. We're here today to talk a little bit and give you a little introduction to different clean energy technologies for, for individual single family homes. Mass CEC, we are a quasi-governmental agency. Um, we are funded by assistance benefit charge, a small assistance benefit charge on everyone's electricity bill. It tends to average about 29 cents per residential customer per month. And that money goes into a fund um, that helps Mass CEC focus on encouraging the clean energy economy in Massachusetts. So that there's a number of different programs that we run. Some you might have heard of our, our internship program, which helps to pay for college students to work at clean energy firms across the state. Our offshore wind um, uh, holdings. We, we own a blade testing facility in Charlestown and the New Bedford Marine Terminal where a lot of the offshore wind will be deployed from and a lot of the jobs will be created. We also have a, a long history in clean heating and cooling technologies, uh, solar PV, microgrids, battery storage. And so today we just um, wanted to, with an eye to single family homeowners, take a look at different clean energy technologies that are appropriate for single family homes. And just sort of as an aside, for all of these technologies, it, every home can be different. So it's important that you actually get a real installer out to give you a free consultation about the appropriateness of the technologies we're talking about for the individual home. And they can give you estimated costs, uh, designs, and give you a sense of what the payback and current incentives might be. So today, um, just as an overview of what we'll be covering, we'll be beginning with heat pumps for heating and cooling. Then we'll talk a little bit about solar photovoltaics, solar hot water, and electrical vehicle charging. So first, before I get into heat pumps, I just wanna mention that every home in the state, energy efficiency should always be the first action taken before looking at any of these different technologies. Um, you want to really insulate as much as possible and air seal as much as possible. And there are very generous incentives through the Mass Save program. For example, single family homeowners can expect 75% uh, of the cost of eligible insulation to be paid for by the Mass Save program and 10 hours of free air sealing. So you really want to improve that building envelope, those outer walls, windows, doors, and other openings of the building before you start looking at these systems. Because if you have lower heat load requirements, you're going to have much smaller systems that you have to um, install. That means lower cost, and it usually means that they'll have better efficiencies as well. So heat pumps. Heat pumps provide heating and cooling using air either from or heat either from the air or the ground. And they are using electricity to transfer heat into a space or out of a space. So an air source heat pump, for example, is very similar to a window air conditioning unit in cooling mode. It brings uh, cool air into the home and rejects the heat from the inside outside. But the nice thing about an air source heat pump is it can be reversed then in winter and take the heat that's in the ambient air, sort of compress it and concentrate it and bring it into the home. Air source heat pumps are have been around for a long time. Um, they're very off the shelf, shelf technology. Thousands of uh, them are installed in the state. They can be installed as either ducted or ductless systems. They tend to be a little bit less expensive as well. Then ground source heat pumps uh, take advantage of the relatively st stable temperature just 10 feet down in the ground of about 50, a little bit higher than 50, 50 degrees to um, take advantage of that differential in temperature to do the same thing, concentrate that heat or concentrate that cooling to heat and cool a building. Ground source heat pumps tend to be a little more expensive than air source heat pump systems. Um, they do last a longer time. They also can deal with hot water heating. Uh, they do require custom engineering. 
So heat pumps, as I mentioned, do use that same process of a refrigerator. Um, one thing that's really nice about them is that they are all efficient, uh, or they're efficient all in one heating and cooling using electricity. And of course, uh, we know to meet our 2050 greenhouse gas goals, we're gonna need to start getting fossil fuels like gas and oil out of our heating system. So this is a really attractive alternative. Uh, and when you think about uh, currently the renewable mix on the electricity grid in Massachusetts is 16%, that will be going up over time. And it is, of course, possible to buy 100% renewable energy for a fairly small premium to run these systems. I know many people, when they think of electric heat, think, oh, terribly inefficient, very expensive. And you have to remember this technology is actually quite a bit more efficient than what the standard electric baseboard that people are used to and that really did have, do have out of control uh, heating costs. Uh, it's often two to three times more efficient than that. So heat pumps are very widely used. Even in Massachusetts, cold climate um, heat pumps, thousands and thousands of them are installed each year for both cooling, probably predominantly, but also for heating. Um, they're used internationally too. Uh, Europe, widespread use, uh, China, Japan, many, many years of use. So we're sort of later adopters here in the United States, but um, you can be sure that they're well tested. Uh, this technology also has improved quite a bit for cold climate um, areas, so in the last 10 to 15 years. And cl cold climate heat pumps perform really well, even on the coldest days in New England. Um, they're used often in Maine and colder parts of Canada in Alaska. So you can be sure that a heat pump can actually heat to the extent that you need it in a Massachusetts climate. So who's a good candidate for air source heat pumps and why would you want to consider it? Um, so folks who are on a high cost heating fuel in Massachusetts, so oil, propane, electric resistance heat, you can have significant savings by moving to air source heat pumps. Um, and on the order of several hundred dollars a year if you would move over to that. Um, however, right now, natural gas is actually quite inexpensive in Massachusetts. So switching from a natural gas heating system to heat pumps might involve a slightly higher heating cost. You do want to keep in mind, though, that especially if you use a decent amount of cooling, you will be saving compared to regular air conditioning costs. Those might weigh, weigh each other out. And uh, you also want to look in the future. Uh, it's pretty unlikely that the gap that we have currently between natural gas and electricity will be as wide in five to 10 years. Uh, so you may see that that's really not a significant issue in the long term. If you do not have central air conditioning right now and you're using window units, uh, air source heat pumps are a really, really attractive way to add air conditioning without the cost of adding central ducting to your home. Um, it's a way to get rid of uh, really uh, loud AC units, window AC units. Um, it, it's a very quiet technology and it's not necessarily super expensive. Folks who have um, hot or cold spots in their home, instead of having to replace an entire heating system, can use um, air source heat pumps to help uh, even out and give you sort of uh, duct zoned home comfort solutions that um, can help meet your needs. And there's not just one look. I think most people are most familiar with the wall mounted traditional um, head on the wall. That's what you tend to see most in a restaurant or in Europe when you go visit. However, there are ones that look like floor mounted ones. They look a little bit more like a radiator. Um, also, uh, if you go to a ducted system, either cassettes or slim ducts um, are very similar to what most people are used to in ducted systems. So there are some things that are different about air source heat pumps. Uh, one of the things you need to be aware of is that the owner is going to have to ensure that that outdoor compressor stays above the snow line. If you don't, uh, if it gets 
encased in snow, it's not going to work effectively. And uh, you definitely are going to need to make sure that it gets digged out, dug out. So when you are digging out your driveway, you're going to want to make sure that the compressors don't have snow around them as well. Properly uh, designing the system and installing it is super important to get the efficiencies that we really want to see with this equipment. Um, and of course, as I mentioned at the beginning, you really want to start with insulating well and air sealing well, and that will result in smaller equipment, better comfort, and the best savings for you. One other thing that people perhaps aren't as used to is because they're conditioned to using a setback thermostat at night to aggressively cut the temperature while they're sleeping. Uh, air source heat pumps actually work better when they're, they're set and at a certain temperature and then just left there. Um, if you set them back too aggressively at night, you'll find that they have a slow recovery time and you might not be that comfortable in the morning. So um, you want to definitely, if you start talking to an installer or uh, encourage your friends to talk to an installer, to make sure that they are looking at cold climate heat pumps. Most installers in Massachusetts will do that, but you want to make sure, uh, you want to also, mentioned that you want them to heat and cool. There are heat pumps that are only for cooling, uh, but you're going to want to, if you want to, if your goal is really to offset some of your fossil fuel use, you want to be using these into the heating system. Cost effectiveness of these uh, systems does definitely vary a lot on the home layout, the type of efficiency of the current heating system and the fuel that you're using. But in terms of cost, uh, adding a single compressor single head system can be as low as $3,500. Um, if you have a ducted system currently, and say, for example, your air conditioning uh, unit is at the end of its life, putting a heat pump that will heat and cool on the end of that ducted system might be in the range 10, 12,000, perhaps larger, depending on how, how um, big the home is. If you're going to go for completely shut, uh, offsetting the entire heating of your home, um, you may be looking at a, a cost more akin to $18,000 to $24,000. And ground source is even more expensive. Um, we have the per ton capacity there, um, but it will be more expensive. Uh, there are, of course, tax credits available and some rebate programs for some of these technologies that can help. The one other thing I w might want to mention just is the terminology around central air source heat pumps. You might hear someone talk on a larger home about a variable refrigerant flow system. Basically, they're just talking about a central system. Instead of having one compressor on the outside and one head on the inside, you're talking about one compressor outside that can handle many rooms, like eight or nine heads in different rooms. Uh, one nice thing about that is that for a cost premium on VRF, it is possible to allow heating and cooling at the same time in different rooms, if that's something you're interested in. So another technology that is possible to use for hot water is a heat pump water heater. So again, the same concept of using the warmth in the air to compress and centralize into the hot water that goes into the tank. Uh, it provides uh, renewable sources of heat from the air instead of burning fossil fuels. And because the system does he pull heat out of the surrounding air, it really is not going to work well in super cold spaces. So you, if your basement, you think, typically is not very well insulated and gets below 50 regularly in the winter, you're going to see lower efficiencies if you use this, this kind of um, technology. If you're currently using an electric hot water, you will be looking at savings. Um, in comparison, for most families, a heat pump water heater installed will save about $350 a year as compared to an electric resistance hot water heater. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about solar PV. So uh, solar photovoltaics, when people say solar, they're typically talking about a solar system that generates electricity or what, a, what is short, in short called solar, solar PV. 
So these panels, which are usually put on roofs, but can be uh, mounted over a garage or uh, a, a, an awning, different things like that. Um, these panels, um, there's a lot of them, first of all, in Massachusetts. The costs have come down dramatically over the last four, five years, and this is a very affordable technology with a good payback in Massachusetts. Um, what it does is it, it, they convert sunlight into electricity on the site, um, and that offsets electricity that you would otherwise be purchasing from a utility. In addition to that savings, the not having to buy the electricity, you also generate revenue from the utilities for producing uh, renewable energy. So in terms of the sort of the, the science behind it, the panels need direct sunlight. The sunlight dislodges electron, electrons in a layer of silicone that's in the panels, and then the electrons flow into a layer that, uh, that uh, create a circuit into your home. Um, so this picture shows the panels going into an inverter. Uh, that inverter is going to convert it to the kind of electricity you use into your in your home, and it's going to directly help uh, provide the electricity for your lights or your TV or your washers. Now, in times when you're not using electricity or not much electricity in your home, there might be excess electricity that is generated. And so it goes through this meter and feeds back onto the utility service lines. So that is what is sometimes referred to as net metering. And what uh, net metering is allowed in Massachusetts, and basically what it means is you're going to start generating a, um, a credit on your bill that will um, you can use in other times of the year. So people tend to generate more electricity during the summer if they have a larger system than they actually use, but then they have a credit in the winter when the sun is lower and the panels are not producing as much electricity. So who's a good candidate for solar PV? Um, first, just about anyone who has a relatively new roof. Um, it does save hundreds of dollars a year on your electricity bill, Systems often pay for themselves in under eight years, depending on tax liability. And um, the that means that you will, if you're in your home for a long time, you would be uh, getting free electricity for 17 or more years. Um, if you are low income and qualify for the Mass Solar Loan Program, pay it back can be even shorter in the four to five year range. Um, that's very attractive. And if you think you might sell your home, there are actually very well done studies showing that uh, the sales price does translate well to sales as long as you have an educated real estate agent. Uh, there are a number of very good uh, training programs that Mass CEC has sponsored called Sell the Sun that allows for continuing education for your real estate agents. So if you do have a solar system and you're planning to sell, you wanna make sure they've taken those courses. Uh, one other big advantage, of course, is that you are generating right on site fossil fuel free electricity. Um, it allows you to decrease your carbon footprint of your home. So things to think about if you're looking at solar fee PV, uh, you really need a pretty sunny area free of shading from trees and obstructions. You also need a relatively new roof. Uh, it's generally best if it's less than five years old that it's been replaced. Uh, the reason is, is your roof often will last about 30 years. Uh, solar PV panels will often last 25 to 30 years. And you want the lifetimes of those two to match up well so that you don't have problems with one or the other in that period. Do keep in mind that if the electricity grid shuts down, your solar system will too. Uh, that's really a safety issue. As I showed you in that picture, the electricity feeds back onto the grid. Uh, and so in a power shortage to protect workers, you're not going to see that unless you have an islandable system that you'll be able to actually use the solar that you have. Uh, one other way to use the solar that you have is to have battery backup system. Um, 
Another thing to keep in mind is that at about 10 years, the inverters that change the electricity from the type that is generated on your roof to what you actually use in your home, they tend to have about a 10 year um, lifetime. So you do want to budget for replacement of that. And a solar installer who comes into your home and runs the numbers for you is going to be putting that in their uh, pro forma that shows you what the payback is for your particular home. So what kind of costs are we talking about? So I said solar has come down way, way, way in price. Uh, residential, we're talking around $3.8 uh, $3 uh, a watt. Uh, a typical residential system that's probably going to be around $20,000. Um, and there are many tax credits and incentives available, as well as um, lending programs that often result in you actually saving more um, in electricity savings and incentives than you do on the payment for the loan. Um, another option, if you don't want to borrow for it or own it yourself, is to go for third-party ownership. So this is sort of the concept of leasing your, your roof. Um, usually there's not a huge financial benefit for the owner, uh, around 10% reduction in the electricity cost. And you do want to be mindful of accelerator clauses uh, over time for what, how much the electricity would be um, that, that you're buying off of your system, how much that goes up over time. Because electricity prices may change in the future, uh, especially as we see things like offshore wind come into place in the state. If you want to look at a, uh, a so the cost, like who should you take a look at for a solar installer, uh, MassCC has a really great uh, tool for you to use. So we are lucky because every system that is installed in the state has to report to the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center under the produ production tracking system in order to get incentives. So there's great, great data about uh, who installs in your area, what their average costs are, what kind of equipment they use. So we encourage you to take a look uh, at the installer snapshot, uh, search by your county, see who's been doing the biggest volume at the best cost, maybe get a couple of those in, those people in to take a look at your at your needs at your home and give you a quote. Solar hot water. Um, so solar collectors use the sun. It's a similar concept to creating electricity, but instead of creating electricity, they heat fluid that heats uh, a home's hot water for your showers, sinks, dishwaters, your, basically your domestic hot water. So the picture on the left shows um, some net zero homes in Boston that include both solar electric or solar PV, that's the bigger part of the panels, and then also a solar hot water panel in the middle. Um, the sun, basically what's happening is the sun's energy is preheating the water and allowing the hot water boiler to run a lot less often. Uh, solar hot water system can supply 50 to 80 percent of a home's annual hot water needs. A lot of times people who want to go all electric on their home will put in um, a electric resistance hot water tank for the remainder or any like mismatch between summer and winter loads. So who is a good candidate for solar hot water? Um, if by chance you have a site that's not very good for solar PV because of too much shading, um, solar hot water is actually quite a bit more forgiving of shade than solar PV is. Uh, there are pretty attractive incentives and tax credits actually out there. Um, the 0% heat loan offered by the Mass Save program can cover the cost of this. And uh, it's a much cheaper way to go solar. Uh, instead of looking at a $20,000 system, you're probably looking at something more in the range of $6,000 for a residential home. Um, I will, one more thing I will say about solar hot water is um, maintenance is really important. Solar PV, there's really not a lot of maintenance um, over time. You basically need to make sure your internet connection is working. But even if that goes down, it's going to keep generating and feeding into your meter. Um, solar hot water, though, if it's not maintained uh, well, can 
mean that things overheat, that the different valves turn off, and that you can create a real problem that can, can put the whole system at jeopardy. Finally, electric vehicle charging. So Massachusetts is going to really see a dramatic increase in the amount of electric vehicles in the next 10 years. Uh, in Massachusetts, transportation actually accounts for a whopping 43% of our greenhouse gases in the state. Uh, and electrical vehicles in combination with renewable carbon-free electricity generation can really dramatically reduce your greenhouse gas emissions. Um, they have much lower life cycle emissions than gas-powered cars even after accounting for additional emissions from battery manufacturing. And there are a lot of great choices coming on the market right now, from all electric vehicles to hybrids with plug-in options. And they're really a lot of fun to drive. Uh, great pickup, great power. Electric vehicle owners just love to like drive, have them drive your car because uh, they just really like their cars. Um, there are also electric vehicles are also a lot cheaper to run if you go with a not a hybrid plug-in but a full electric vehicle um well you'll be talking about around a thousand two hundred dollars less in fuel costs uh so the operating costs are less expensive uh even more important if you go with the full electric option you have a lot fewer moving parts and therefore you have a lot cheaper maintenance costs and many less visits to get your car uh, serviced. So electric vehicles don't need oil changes. They have no transmission fluids, no fuel pumps, timing belts, and a lot of other moving parts that are issues and require you to bring in your car a lot, your oil car a lot. Um, people do worry about running out of charge, but um, electric vehicles are constrained really by their battery capacity, and the battery range has been really improving every year. So the high, highly rated Chevrolet Bolt has a range of 259 miles. The Tesla Model 3 tops 310 miles. And with the network of charging stations continuing to expand with many apps that, that help you locate public charging station, this really doesn't have to be an issue for you. And actually, most homeowners, I, I think people tend to be worried to have this range anxiety, but most homeowners charge at home. They charge overnight. Uh, some of them don't even upgrade to a level two charger. They just use the regular 110 and are patient about having it done at night. Um, so really those are not big issues in the long term. So there's lots more. We've just given a quick highlight and introduction to a lot of these technologies. There's a lot more information on our website. I encourage you to take a look at this information and to call us with any questions you have. Take care. Bye.